Now for this series, most of our programmes are coming from here. This is Soho House in Hansworth. The dining room was the focus of this house. Hello and welcome to Doorstep History. Now for this series, most of our programmes are coming from here. This is Soho House in Handsworth, the home of Matthew Bolton. And Sarah is with us, as always, and she has a special guest to tell us about the building. So I'm joined by Samina Kosar, Museum Manager at Soho House. But before we go any further, Samina, what is Soho House? Well, Soho House today is a museum and it opened in 1995. But before then, this house was the home of Matthew Bolton, who was a very well-known industrialist who moved here in 1766. Right. So what made him so important? What did he do? What did he give to the city of Birmingham? What did Matthew Bolton give to not only to Birmingham, but further afield? He was really well known for a couple of things. Mm. Um, firstly, his partnership with James Watt. Okay. Um, also, the very first ever Birmingham essay office which opened in 1773 mm. and that was only down to Matthew Bolton. And is it true that Matthew Bolton opened the assay office because he was sending all his silver goods and where a little bit further north and he was getting fed up of that? Absolutely, we only ever had two essay uh, offices and that was back in Chester mm -hmm. and there was one in London and to actually send all oh. of his silverware to be essayed all the way along there without any cars, without all the luxuries that we have today, yeah. it was mainly relying on the canal systems back then. But do you know what surprised me about Matthew Bolton the most? He did all this, he gave the country, the world so much, but he's actually not a very well-known figure, is he? Until a few years ago when something very important happened. Absolutely, in the last couple of years, Soho House Museum, with a lot of partners really helping us, we've really got Matthew Bolton known again with the public. And firstly, just have a look at the 50 pound notes, because he's just on there, not that everybody's got them. <laughs> you turn it around on the back, Matthew Bolton alongside James Watt and their steam engine features on there now. And Samina, there are two very special anniversaries being commemorated this year. Absolutely, Sarah. Um, 2016 is such a big year for us. It's not only the anniversary of the Lunar Society, um, because this is actually the house, the very house they used to come and meet in. And who um, were the Lunar Society? Well, the Lunar Society were a group of 14 men, yeah. ranging from doctors to entrepreneurs to scientists. So you had people like Matthew Bolton, James Watt, wow. and Rasma Darwin, and a lot more, which used to come and meet here on a Monday on a full moon, not because they were werewolves, <laughs> as many people do come and say ask me the question but it was because it was natural light to get them home back safely again and you know the exact room that they met in absolutely the exact room that they used to meet in was the lunar room which is open today for the public and we give them guided tours around wow we can have a sneak peek maybe later absolutely on as well. yes brilliant and the second anniversary is it's actually our 21st birthday this year because not only are we a museum, we've also been the home of Matthew Bolton, it's been a grammar school for girls, it's been a hotel, it's also where the GEC General Electric Company used to rent out the space Gosh. and the single men's quarter as well, which used to be owned by the police. So 21 years as a museum. 21 years as a museum. Well, congratulations. Thank you very much. And we'll get a mini tour, hopefully, in a minute. Absolutely, yes. Brilliant. There we go. So that's a, a good start to this doorstep history. Now, wouldn't it be great, really, if Matthew Bolton was here yeah, now? Yeah, well, well, it would be, yeah. But he Only died would. in 1809. He yeah. did. He well, died. with the wonders of <laughs> modern late. technology, we just ha I've just happened to have an interview with the great man himself. Right, so who will you be, sir? I will be the great Matthew Bolton the owner of the great Soho House. Matthew Bolton was the great entrepreneur, scientist. Many people know him for being the great silversmith, the funder of the steam engine business. But there was a lot more to Matthew Bolton than that. He was an astronomer, a geologist, and a developer of the future of industry. Fantastic. So we'll find out a little bit more about Matthew Bolton later in the programme. But first, can you tell us a little about your magnificent house? Shall we go and have a look? Yes, we shall. 
So you came to this house in 1766? I came up into this region a little before then, after the death of my father and my first wife in 1759. I ended up inheriting my father's business, the great buckle and button making business of Snow Hill. I then wanted to expand that business. I wanted to be the great silversmith, but in order to do that, I needed a bigger establishment. So I came up to here in an area of Staffordshire called Soho. Already here was a red brick house, which I leased for a short period of time. And then I decided to buy 300 acres and the house. And in 1766, I moved in, doing a few conversions here and there. And that enabled me then to be at the center where my manufactory was, just down the bottom of the hill. So this was Hansworth, so it was all countryside in those times, nice rural area, no other factories around. This was a wonderful area. The one reason I wanted the land was I wanted an area to create a park. I created two lakes, enabled to have water to flow into the manufactory to drive the mills. And I wanted to landscape it, which I was able to do. So we could have, if you like, almost like a Garden of Eden in this area, which was to be used by my work colleagues, my friends, so they could actually boat on the lake, fish, and to walk through the woods. This was to be my own little Eden here in Hansworth.
After the break, we'll have more from Soho House in Handsworth, the home of Matthew Bolton, and we'll be going back 40 years to the sound of Beacon Radio in Wolverhampton. Welcome back to Doorstep History. We're here at Soho House in Handsworth, and I'm still with Samina. So, how can people go about visiting? Well, uh, if you would like to come and visit Soho House Museum today, mm. from April to October, we are open Wednesdays to Sundays from 11 till 3, but you can only view the house by guided tour, and it is the best way to go around as well. Yeah. Um, and then after October, we have loads of events on, including Georgian Christmas tours. And if it, anybody would like more information, then we would ask them to either give us a call on 0121 348 8150, mm -hmm. or they can visit our website, which is at www.birminghammuseums.org.uk. Welcome back to Doorstep History. Now people across the black country have been celebrating the 40th anniversary of one of their favourite radio stations, which is... And it was called Beacon Radio. In April 1976, people across the black country turned on their radios and heard this for the very first time, a sound which soon became very familiar. You and me and Beacon 303 WCR-FM, the current community station in Wolverhampton, is remembering the early days of Beacon 303. Stuart Hickman, a familiar voice on Beacon, is now a regular on WCR 101.8 FM. 101.8 WCRFM, the station with more for Wolverhampton on a very special uh, anniversary weekend. We're celebrating 40 years of local radio in Wolverhampton with the start of Beacon on the 12th of April 1976. And I have some old friends of mine in the studio with me. Um, I'd always wanted to be a Beacon because um, it's my hometown radio station. Uh, I joined 88 and I left in 99, so 11 years. So. Um, I started off doing weekend overnights. Uh, then I moved to the late show and then I got the big show which was um, Beacon by Request which was the evening show. I've done hospital radio and I was actually working in Birmingham in the Virgin Mega Store, as it was known, um, which had got a little in-store radio station. And one of the people who worked on there was Bob Lawrence who worked at Beacon, he made all the commercials. But while I was there, Pete Wagstaff, who was the program controller, came and said hello. And he said, oh, he said, um, Bob mentions that you're quite good at driving the desk. And I thought, really? <laughs> and he said, we've got a, a news program and we need someone to drive it would you like to have a go and th that was how it started so I started doing that and then they took me on full time as what they used to call a TO technical operator which was kind of um, you know playing the commercials playing records for people of various things so that was how I started and now I'm here on the breakfast show which I absolutely love even the getting up at four o'clock in the morning <laughs> 101.8 WCRFM the station with more for Wolverhampton I was a trainee teacher in Worcestershire in the 1970s and I heard Beacon come on the air. was captivated by it because I'd been a fan of well thought out radio, formatted radio. I'd been a student of radio for years and listened and knew all about the pirates, knew all about American radio. When I heard Beacon, I suddenly knew these people knew exactly what they were doing. A lot of the other commercial stations, or in those days they were called independent stations, were a bit hesitant and a bit making it up as they went along but Beacon I knew straight away so I, I applied for Beacon got turned down 20 times and more and eventually in 1979 got an audition and went on the air uh, and I was there till 1988 my full-time show was nine to midday 
and that was from 1981 to 1984. In those days, we rather patronisingly called it the housewife show, because in those days, men went out to work, Goodyear, GKN, the foundries and what have you. So at nine o'clock, the demographic skewed markedly and became very female. So the pro promotions man at the time was a man called Peter Noyce Thomas, um, said, um, well, do you think we should give, give something away that the audience will use? Well, they're housewives. Um, so he said, well, we'll give away tea towels and aprons. And of course, everybody fell about laughing. So, What's anybody going to... But bless him, it was a good idea. Because as a piece of merchandise, it's something that will go into someone's house. You would look at it and laugh and think it's quite a novelty you wouldn't throw it away. That was point one, you wouldn't throw it away. And secondly, it's something that people would use. Little did I know, 30 years later, I still know people who say, you know, you know, we wipe the dishes with your face. So I'm very grateful. I'll take anything I can get. To be part of people's domestic life, even at this advanced stage, is a sheer delight. So the station used to be heard right across the black country, didn't it? Oh, yes. We've got some eye dents, haven't we? Many places. If you lived in... Uh, Cozy. You could hear it also in... Penkridge. As well as... Burton. Oh, and not forgetting... Bilston. All over. Brilliant. Uh, what took me to Beacon was um, I needed the money. I'd finished on telly and um, the work wasn't coming in and then... And, and ironically, Peter Tomlinson got in touch with me. So the man who invented Tis Was employed one of the people who helped kill it off. So I needed it. But to be honest, there was a big family uh, sigh of relief because I'm radio. I'm radio. And we all know the, you know, radio for centuries giving work to ugly people. But I think that I'm, I'm radio and television it was all about the technology and that really talented people in television are the ones who aren't phased by the technology. I would give you an example. Here, we're always looking for microphones. In radio, you're always looking for the microphone. Um, when I went to television, and I hadn't done much, I'd done some schools, I was always looking for the microphone. So if you look at the first Tiswazes, it's me going, hello there and welcome, because the microphones are up in the ceiling. And I was going, hello, how are you? And all that, and so you saw, you, people were quite intimate with my nostrils for a while. Yeah. It's jingle time, and here's a medley of my greatest hit. Gordon, Gordon, you drive away your boredom. <laughs> if you wake up feeling ghastly, <laughs> And that's kept me out the big time. So, bring it bang up to date, what you're up to at the moment? I'm a professional granddad. Um, I retired six years ago, and I was the last to find out. Uh, I, thought, thought, I thought my phone had been cut off. Then I realised I'd been cut off. Um, so the writing's on the wall, um, and, and I'm glad in a way. I know we all make the best of what, well, we should make the best of what's happened to us in life. But I didn't want to be the oldest guy rattling around the radio station and people giving me a job application adverts and saying, oh, have you ever considered working for the World Service in Botswana? Um, I, I didn't want to be that guy and um, fortuitously I was never to become that guy so I didn't outstay my welcome um, and the uh, best years of my life, 40 years isn't, isn't a bad track record you know but I've still got it you know if there's anybody out there Those were in the days when the jingles were better than the music I worked at Beacon from 76 to 79 before joining BRMB. First show was on the 17th of April at, uh, in 1976 and to say I was nervous was an understatement because I'm used to being in an environment where there's lots of people and you get instant reaction if you do something right or wrong and it was a big buzz and I'm in a studio on my own and um, independent radio news was on and I'm sitting there and it was one minute past nine, two minutes past nine. I'd done probably an hour's worth of rehearsal beforehand and the last song I played 
on a Friday night previous to the first disco show was the Fatback Band Wiki Wacky and that was the first song that came out so it went on the turntable and went out with a jingle then it went live and I opened the microphone I was shaking like a leaf so it was a scream my first words on radio were not audible it was just a scream and once I got into the groove closed my eyes and away it went so I did my training if you like live on air KKJ! That was the initials I was using. It was Chris Kennedy Jr., but KKJ carried the swing, and I didn't use Chris Kennedy Jr. till I moved over to BRB. So just one more time. KKJ! You know, these, these guys, they are pure enthusiasts, and I just cannot believe it's 40 years ago since the Sunshine Sound of Beacon Trio 3. You are the sunshine, yeah. You are the reason we do what we do. That's all from this edition of Doorstep History. Goodbye and thanks for watching. Bye. Bye.